Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, what a great turnout! Wow, this is this is uh, far out as we used to say back in the '60s. Uh, uh, you know, I I, I was in uh, Cambridge uh, about a year and a half ago doing some interviews for the book, and uh, it's great to be back. Um, I kind of feel like I'm returning to the scene of the crime here. Uh, uh, right after this, I'm going to uh, up to Millbrook, New York, where some of you may know uh, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert. That's where they landed after they got kicked out of Harvard in 1963, so I'm kind of following their, 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 their footsteps. But it's really right here in Cambridge where this whole uh, long, strange trip began in, in 1960, the fall of 1960, and that's a half century ago. <laughs> which just kind of, caught, I just realized that a few days ago. We're closer to 2060 than we are to 1960 this year. That's the dividing point. But we're still talking about the 60s. Um, this is my second reading of the, of the book. Uh, the first one was in Marin County last week, uh, just across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco, which is where I live. Um, uh, but the first four chapters of the book take place in and around Cambridge. Uh, and then uh, after that, the, the action shifts out to San Francisco around uh, 65 when everyone came to San Francisco with or without flowers in their hair. And uh, the center of the psyched psychedelic cyclone kind of shifted from Boston to, uh, to Baghdad by the Bay, as my old colleague at the uh, Chronicle, Herb Cain, <laughs> used to call our, our city. Um, but before I get to the book, I wanted to start out by talking, just addressing a rumor that's already going around about the book. Uh, I don't know who started this rumor, but someone has started, says that there's, a, on page 108, there is 250 micrograms of LSD sprayed on the upper left-hand corner. <laughs> now, now, I want to say unequivocally that that is not true. And as a matter of fact, I tore off the corner of that page about an hour ago. <laughs> And let me just say that I have, there's absolutely no <laughs> change. The white light. Look, everybody, look, look at the white light. I mean, I, uh, maybe it's, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> it's been a crazy couple of weeks for me. Um, this is my fourth book. I've never had, you know, this much media interest and in early sales like we've had the first week. And it's, it's kind of a mind, mind blowing, pardon the expression again. Um, uh, the New York Times had a real nice review last Friday, which, I mean, I just, I'm still kind of floating from that. Um, and there's, and there, there's a wide range of interest. I was all, just a few days ago, I was on this, uh, show, show Coast to Coast. It's an AM radio syndicate, like 200 AM stations across the country. It used to be the Art Bell show. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and I was on from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. West Coast time. So that's 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. here. You'd be amazed, they say, how many people are up and listening to this show, which is devoted to the paranormal, UFOs, New Age uh, mysticism, and uh, vast government conspiracies. So it was, uh, it was an interesting, <laughs> it was an interesting three hours and I'm just kind of recovering from all that. So, you know, it's just a weird, I've been a newspaper reporter for a long time, but recent years I've been writing books and it's a weird business because the last year or so I've just been in my basement in my pajamas, you know, finishing this book and all of a sudden it's like bright lights, big city, nonstop talking. So if I'm a little spaced out, that's, <laughs> that's why. It's not, the, it's not the acid from page 108. Uh, um, I've, I've gotten about a dozen reviews so far. They've been all good except for one, which was in SF Weekly, which is kind of the, the not the, really the phoenix of the Bay Area. That's one with the Bay Guardian, but an alternative weekly. And uh, the guy, I think, was set up to hate the book because you can tell from the first sentence it was, uh, what was it? Oh, yeah. Yes, another 60s history. So when it starts out like that, you know it's going to be <laughs> all downhill, no matter what you say <laughs> about the 60s. And I can understand that sentiment because, you know, if I was uh, in my 20s or early 30s, I think I'd be sick of listening to all us old timers talk about the great old <laughs> days of the 1960s. So I understand that sentiment, but um, well, enough preliminary banter. Let me talk a little bit about the book. Uh, Actually, that sort of leads to a question that maybe some young people might have, or, or old people for that matter, about this. I mean, what do four relics from the 60s, the characters in my book, have to do with the way we're living our lives today? Um, in other words, why the hell should I read this book? 
Um, so let me briefly count the ways that I think Timothy Leary, Ram Dass, Houston Smith, and Andrew Weil, and really the whole counterculture of the 1960s, and particularly this, the psychedelic part of the counterculture, matter to us living here today, and how we can see that in things happening right now. So this is just a partial list, but um, yoga, studios on, yoga studios on practically every corner in the Bay Area, and probably around here too, and maybe even in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, Steve Jobs in Silicon Valley, uh, one interesting aspect, I don't go into it in a lot of detail in this book because there's been another book written about it, but the guys in the early Silicon Valley computer revolution were influenced by psychedelics. Uh, Steve Jobs, actually the guy who invented the mouse, uh, he was, uh, he credited, he, he was actually turned on by a guy named Jim Fadiman who was turned on by Richard Alpert very early on. And he says he got the idea for the mouse because of new way of thinking because of psychedelics. So that's, that's one way. Organic produce in your local supermarket. Deepak Chopra, the environmental movement. People who say they're spiritual but not religious. Doctors who prescribe uh, meditation for cardiac patients. The Unabomber. Long story. Uh, the sexual revolution. Wayne Dyer, medical marijuana. Ecstasy fueled raves. Esalen Institute, out here Omega Institute, and really the whole way we think about life, death, and the nature of reality itself. Uh, so before, uh, you know, I, I can't really ex explain all those in this short talk, but that's why you have to buy my book, but uh, <laughs> here's, here's the bottom line. I mean, millions of people in my generation, and by that I mean the baby boomers, uh, took LSD and other kinds of psychedelic drugs in the 1960s. And we, including myself, had some profoundly enlightening and or sometimes simultaneously <laughs> terrifying, soul-shattering experiences on these drugs that I don't think we all really quite understood. In the sense that, sure, we had these amazing experiences, perhaps, and these terrifying experiences, but what happened after the ecstasy? You know, how, does psych how did psychedelic drugs change the way we actually live our lives? Did they make us better people? Did they make us more aware people? And to me, that's the important question. Um, I wanted to, the book's not about me. I do have an afterword where I talk about some of my own experiences, and I struggle whether to put that in there or to come out of the closet, and I'm coming out of the closet on, on, <laughs> on this. But, um, you know, my long, strange trip kind of began in, really in high school, when, uh, which in my case was the late 60s, when I read the last novel that Aldous Huxley wrote, which was Island which was about this cynical reporter who shipwrecked on an island and he goes native, kind of like Avatar, you know, same story, <laughs> same storyline. He goes native and they take this Moshka medicine and they live in cosmic harmony with the cosmos and themselves and, of course, the cynical reporter, you know, goes native. And uh, now, Island, I reread that when I was starting to work on the book, and it didn't actually fare too well with the passage of time. It's, I mean, it wasn't Huxley's best novel by any means. But that got me, that, that book got me interested in The Doors of Perception, which is a book that Huxley wrote in 1954 about his experiences on mescaline in the spring of 1953. And he, he was given mescaline by a, a, a doctor, Dr. Humphrey Osmond, a British researcher who had done research on LSD and alcoholism and other things. Um, and he was guided on that trip by, by, by uh, Osmond. Uh, yeah, they actually coined the word psychedelic together. Uh, and they had several different words that they, that they thought about using. And they would make up little couplets and rhymes to see how the word sounded in, you know, in, in a sentence or in a poem. And the word for psychedelic, their, their, their poem for psychedelic was to fathom hell or, or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. And uh, that sort of sealed the deal, I guess, with that, with that word. Well, I was in utero in New Jersey when this happened, uh, when, when, when Huxley had his baptismal trip in his home in the Hollywood Hills in the spring of 1953. And he later wrote in The Doors of Perception uh, about staring down at his gray flannel trousers, the isness of his trousers. And he looked at the curtains in his library and they reflected the miraculous fact of sheer existence. And it's just all so beautiful, another expression we used to say back in those days. 
Uh, well, the doors of perception gave birth to the psychedelic drug culture, and it also, I think, sparked something in me personally, which was a desire to alter my state of consciousness in a different way than the beer and pot parties I used to go to in high school, which was to take a deeper look into my own heart and, and mind. And uh, 